Welcome back to Destinations of History. I'm Joshua Hanlon. Today I'm sitting down with Bill Butler. We're going to be talking about his service during the Second World War, his time training for the Army, serving in a M3 tank in both the North African and Italian campaigns, and all of his different experiences during the war. So thank you so much for sitting down with me here, Bill. You're welcome. Why don't we start off with kind of the beginning of your story. Tell me a little bit about your, your childhood and what your, your upbringing was like as a kid. Well, my childhood, uh, we moved a lot. My father was a traveling salesman. So we lived in uh, Billings, Montana, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We traveled to North and South Dakota, and we got back into Michigan and a farm, and the farm didn't pay off, so we moved to Grand Rapids, and then, uh, let's see, yeah, that's about when I went into the Army. Uh, I went down to the Air Cadets, and I passed every trick, everything they asked me to do, and twist me around and everything, but my overbite was too much for the Air Cadets. I said, I'm going to bite them, not bite them. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it was. So I waited for the draft, which was not too long. And uh, then my draft number came up and I went to Fort Knox. And uh, I spent a year there in and out because on arriving in Knox, they sent us down to a uh, Louisiana in the swamps, and we lost a few tanks down there. We didn't have radios in the beginning, and so we had to use flags. And uh, so uh, then we got on the highways and traveling from there into Texas and so on. And uh, we went so slow that we'd pull off the side of the road and the traffic could go by. Well, the officers usually had a wife, and they would be sitting down there waving to them. I've got to tell you this. We run over one lady's fender. She was sticking out too far. And the driver of the tank that run over me, I said, what happened to her? Well, she just pissed her pants. Now, I didn't know at the time, but I found out later, this was General Stop it. No. You're good. Patton. <laughs> Patton. <laughs> so thanks, Garrett. You're, here, I'll just set this back here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> we didn't find this out till years later, but uh, her lieutenant uh, was our leader at the time, and we found out all about this. And uh, he was lieutenant, and he became a lieutenant colonel before the uh, invasion, so he had some help there. Well, anyway, uh, we went from Louisiana into Texas a little ways, and then we'd come back the southern route in North Carolina, South Carolina, because Fort Bragg is out there. And then they put us on a train and send us back. And uh, How, when when you when you first got uh, drafted yeah. and sent to to Fort Knox, yeah, uh, what was your experience like, kind of transitioning to to being in the the army, and how how did that go for you with the first well, weeks of training? Well, uh, I, the training we we didn't have guns; they were sending them all to England. So we just trained them by walking, walking, walking. And then they gave us these little M2 tanks that had a little 37 on them. And uh, we got radios later on, but quite a bit later. And uh, So this was before, was, this was before Pearl Harbor? So, yeah, it, so at yeah. that point, the, mm -hmm. the, the goal for the U.S. was to support the Allies and not necessarily. I had 11 months in at Pearl Harbor time. And, uh, then soon afterwards, we were shipped to Fort Dix in the east and trained a little more. 
And then they had uh, radios put in the M4 tanks for us. And so our communications was good. Because you didn't wave flags to the Germans to tell what's going on. Anyway, uh, then after about a month or two at Fort Dix, we went by a, a troop ship. There was 5,000 men in the base of it, and there were 5,000 men on top. So when we ate, they went down one side and got in their bunks, and we went up top side. And that's the way we got fed twice a day that way. And uh, it was quite a situation because they changed the swimming pools over to oh, 12 or 14 stools for you. And uh, we needed that and a lot of others because the food uh, wasn't the greatest. And uh, so you had diarrhea in a big way. <laughs> but the minute you left your bunk, there was another guy come down to get into your bunk. And so you spent the rest up there. They took us north, uh, like Green, Green Field, Green? Greenland? Yeah. And up the north to uh, get away from the submarines. If we went straight across, we'd be in a path. So then they took us down to North Ireland, and we spent uh, so maybe six months there. And then we uh, thought we were going on a landing, but we landed across in England, and then they took us to the southern part of England, and we put in another month or so. Um, Were you training throughout that whole time in Northern Ireland and England? Yeah, driving. And, yeah. In fact, we didn't like this one lieutenant, and he was an officer that followed up and paid off the people. So we made 17 holes in a century-old stone fence, and then we turned around and made 17 more holes. We didn't see any more of that little officer. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we had our landing craft, when we went to Gibraltar, uh, Patton had a group that went down there and they didn't fire a shot. And then we got through Gibraltar and uh, Oran and, uh, well, in Oran they got, really got a lot. But we had a smooth sailing in our zoo, I think it is, yeah. And then <clears throat> they put us in reserve until they needed us. February 14th would be a 42 or 43, 43. Uh, we had fired pass, and uh, they put one company down and two in reserves, and they didn't send us down to seal them all as they come through. They fed the G Company first, and then H Company, and then I Company. And uh, 17 of my uh, I Company came back alive, and the rest were captured or killed, and so on. Well, on the next day, they found some old tanks, and they had one officer. And so we went out against them again, and then uh, they run out of gas or something, and we went up to Kasserine Pass, and uh, we uh, did a, a rest time and got new equipment and so on. And we lived with the Scottish Highlanders for a short time, and I got some stuff from him and things like that. And then we uh, we didn't make any more landings. Everything was on the land uh, through the desert there, and we cleaned them out from the southern part there midsummer, and uh, moved them into Tunis. And uh, then the last big move was to Tunis. In the meantime, I lost a couple more tanks. Then we uh, went down into Italy in the southern part. 
I'm trying to say Naples, but I remember. Is it Salerno? Something like that, yeah. And uh, they wanted to put us up in the mountain to do away with the uh, Monte Cassino, which mm -hmm. was a uh, Catholic uh, situation. But the Germans had us pinpointed, and so we lost some more tanks. And so then they took us out and took us into Anzio. And there they had us uh, dig underground, even the tanks uh, up to their uh, tracks. And we were there for five months. And the Germans, just every day they would come over and, and, and uh, bomb us. Well, they had aircraft all around, and so the, the black guys from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, would chase them off, and oh, they they were they were terrific fighters, and uh, one of them crashed by my dugout, and I run out to see if he was okay. I knew it was going to catch fire. But it didn't, and he come out of swearing. He was a big guy. <laughs> and you know, we didn't get to talk to him for a few minutes, and swoop, they swooped him away. And within um, two hours, they had a little boy there and took his plane away. So we didn't, didn't get any visiting in there. And then the, on Anzio, uh, they had their lines all set. But you see, that was farmland and drained, and so you'd squash it. You had to use roads. There were three roads that we used. And so as soon as we lost the tank, we'd pull back and get it cleared up and try it again. And, uh, well, it, it was just a mess. Mm -hmm. But five months, <clears throat> we'd run over to the kitchen truck and grab our food and get back in the hole again and things like that. Uh, not too interesting, but it was underground. And they dug a nice big pit so that about 50 guys could go down and see movies. And the movies were good movies. And then they brought us some black movies. We'd never seen black actors in it, but a complete movie was black. And they were good. And, uh, we had quite a few blacks working there in uh, service companies and so on. And of course, so the guy that flies in there. And uh, so when we broke out, we took the roads to go to Rome. And Rome was an open city. Well, one of the reasons we were underground is in the mountain they had a railroad gun, 15 inch, something like that. And they would shell us every night, pull back in. Well, the Air Force would bomb it, and they'd put the tracks out, get us the next night. So they had it all figured out. But the Germans were shelling you from the mountains? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, so we went up to uh, within uh, probably 20 miles of Rome, and it was an open city, and so we drove in. And they fed us in Rome, and they uh, uh, did the guard duty, and we slept all night, yeah. It was quiet. But uh, then we had to remove the, the a little north of Rome, and uh, so we got to come back to Rome, and we wanted to see the Pope, and we heard so much about him, but he wouldn't see us. And he wasn't, I don't think he was there, but he wouldn't see us. And uh, there was a Jap, came in on a nice limousine, and we wanted to kill him. Well, you know, it's a war. And they wouldn't let me. They had guards all over us to keep us away because it's it's an open city. Yeah. So then we moved on up north of another 40, 50 miles, Lake Brasciano. And it, it was similar to Lake Michigan, but smaller. And we had a week there to just lay around the sun. And then we started back up again. And we headed to Casa di Elsa. And I'm not sure about the river, but we 
went into winter quarters there and just held the line and they sent me home. Well, sending me home meant go to Port Sheridan and they handed me 90 men and 34 women wax. Now the 90 men didn't give me any trouble, but 34 wax did. <laughs> they, I had a few, the mail clerk, she was good and she delivered everything. And the bus lady, oh Rosie, how I sing to her every night. She was on time at every stop for take the guy through their different steps to go home. And after about a year, they decided I'd been around long enough, they got rid of me. That's about it. <laughs> no. Unless you got some things. Oh, I would love to, yeah. That's, that's, now, go ahead. On, the, on losing the tanks, sometimes they would just knock your tracks off and you go. But most of the time, the shell come inside and there's ricochet around and start a fire and kill off a few. But uh, I was fortunate to get out. There's a driver and an assistant driver. The assistant driver, he just hands over a drink to him or something and keeps him happy, he keeps him going. Then I have a assistant gunner that rams them home and, and picks out smoke or, you know, you'd put smoke out to uh, target a thing and then we'd close in on it and so on. And then uh, the gunner was very good and I kept in touch with the Kentucky boy way until he died and, and uh, I've outlived them all. Anyway, I would set him up and they always had their observers in the temples or uh, the, of the churches. Mm -hmm. Seeples. The seeples. Seeples. Okay. And so we knocked those down. And, and then there's one guy, he was giving us awful of shelling. And I spotted him in that window in the corner of that building. And I said, Take him out, he's in that corner window. And he shot. And I said, You didn't take him out. He said, yes, I did. There's no more shelling. Well, it wasn't. He says, I'll show you. And so he took the end to the building out. And there was nothing there. <laughs> oh, that's a trouble. I had three guys go crazy. And uh, there's nothing you could do for them while they hold them down. Usually it took two, two people to hold them down until the medics could get to you. And, uh, I patched up an awful lot of guys. I, I had one outstanding gunner. I had two outstanding gunners. One was in every revolution in the South America. His wife would pack a certain suitcase for him. She knew he was going. Anyway, he ended up as my governor, gunner, but we got hit so hard and so bad uh, we got him out and he had compound fracture and the, the tank commander always carried uh, oh, the juice that yeah, it puts them under. I can't think of it right now. Anyway, I had five of those and I was supposed to use one on each guy that was in. But he was compact and bleeding like that, so I shot things too. And then I shot him three, and I didn't dare do it anymore. But we finally got him down, and uh, he was in such bad shape that he died. But the rest of them all made it through. We lost all the five tanks up there, and I got back. <coughs> there was one nice thing, though. On the way back, I picked up an infantryman that was lost, and some other wounded. And I headed down the hill, I was the last one out. And they had a 57 back there that was working, and they hit it, and they hit us in the rear end. And I just danced like that. And uh, they took the top of the rotary engine off, so we limped down. And you know, they welded that up and they put an engine in overnight and I was ready to go the next morning. 
but I had to have a new crew, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, ask me what you want to ask me. <laughs> no, that's, that's oh, Wait excellent. a minute. Yeah. Of course, the, the pieces Fine. right here. Okay. Where I was taking the wounded off of the, uh, okay, off the mountain, it doesn't matter. I got hit with this 47, and the ball went in and ricocheted around and took the motor out and everything. And uh, then later on, just before we broke out, we had a 76 that hit us on the side. And uh, it was right by me, and so it set fire to the rubber packing, and so we bailed out. And uh, this was in my bedroll. My bedroll was the only thing that wasn't hurt. That was four blankets. And uh, so uh, I called in on the radio after I saw this rubber had burned out, and the old man says, just bluff them. Well, that do not sound good, you know. So we crawled in that sucker and we bluffed them out that night. And then they gave us a new tank and we went on. What were the big differences between the, the M3 and the M4? Did, did, you, did you think the M4 was, was a big improvement over the M3? Well, the M4 was an improvement, yeah, because you couldn't move the big gun only a little bit. On the M3? And then, then, then we'd move the tank to get on the target. Mm -hmm. And you don't have time to do that. When we were in uh, run out of uh, Fayed Pass, we had a couple of those old threes and uh, three of the M4s. And they took the mess sergeant and put him in charge of the tank. And he says, I don't know anything about this. Give me an easy job to do and you take over. So I put him down to loading the 75 because he could sit down there and just jam it. He didn't have to do anything else. And so that's the way we went for about two or three days. And uh, oh, then he fed us so well at Catherine that a general come around to see what our food was like. and. The general says, get your stuff together. You're going with me. He says, no way, general. He says, I'm staying with my outfit. And the general pointed to the star and he said, do you see that? You know what it means? Yes, sir, I'll get ready right away. <laughs> okay, so then he was given a jeep to do anything he wanted. So he would bring us cakes uh, oh, and uh, whipped cream puffs. Can you imagine that? Uh, in yeah. the middle of the desert. Huh? In, in, in the desert. Yeah. The general had everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, one of them was so bad, he drilled a hole clear through a mountain so he could drive his tank out and look and then get it back in. So talk a little bit about kind of the the design of the tank that you were in and kind of how like how the guys were positioned inside, what that was like while you were inside the tank. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Facing out of the gun, the driver was down to the left and the assistant driver to the right. Oh, and he had a trap door uh, there that he could drop and we could crawl out. But we're all so close to the ground we could go out. Anyway, then the assistant gunner is on the left side back there, and he can handle all the ammunition, and, and he was in on the no way. He was good. And then the gunner was uh, just down in front of me, and he did all the sighting and, and the actual firing and so on, and uh, I was up above. Uh, we tried uh, using periscopes because they weren't worth a hoot. And uh, uh, so then we tried using binoculars, and that didn't work out because you're shaking all the time. So we just had to go by eyesight and stick your head out. But don't stick it too far because 
of one of our young lieutenants uh, put his helmet on, but didn't put his steel helmet over it, which you can do, and uh, he got his head shot off. And we found out later that he was the stepson of General Marshall that's in charge of all the armies of the world. Yeah. Wow. But we lost him early. He was a good officer, though. Yeah. What, as a as a tanker, what were the biggest concerns for you in terms of the biggest dangers? Was it things like mines under the ground? Was it artillery attacks? Was it uh, airplanes? What were some of the the main things that you were well, concerned about I in the tank? I would say the mines was big because they could blow it off and then they got a sitting target for you. But uh, the air just would uh, go down the uh, road there and uh, straddle the road. And if you got off the side of the road, you were free clear, you know. And uh, can I tell you something about some of the Negro troops? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm really thrilled with what they, uh, they fed us. They would go beyond the lines where our outpost is and brought us gas and they brought us food. They did a good job. And then, <clears throat> so hold it a minute, hold it a minute. Hmm? Um, oh, okay, I was gonna tell you about the infantry. Now, the infantry was tr all white officers and that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had pulled back after we removed the guns on that one more hill and here we saw a black infantryman on his belly crawling up and I said what the hell are you doing he said we're going up to the front I said you got a mile to go yet and so he told me who was the officer was the white officer I said you can't do that to those boys put them on the road and if you see an airplane get the side of the road they just want the road and so he finally got up there. They walked on up, no trouble. But uh, those white officers just didn't have it to deal with them. I, and, and later we saw some black officers and they were getting along okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's super interesting, thank you. Yeah. What what was when when you weren't in battle? What was your life like, either in uh, North Africa or in Italy? Um, what were some things you would do to kind of occupy your time, uh, or just kind of behind the lines? Well, you just uh, listen to your radio, or uh, read read books or something, just laying around, waiting until you're called to. A hot spot, and a lot of it was just sitting and waiting and sweating at the same time. <laughs> you were in some hot More parts of the world. More than one. <laughs> I don't know. Give me some more questions now. <laughs> so you you participated in some really um, you know significant campaigns and battles. You mentioned. Oh in yeah. That was Valentine's Day in probably 43. Uh, um, oh, Bill, you were there. Fired Pass. And that was a terrible thing. We lost everything, and, and that's why uh, we just used those five tanks to try and hold them off, and then we went up into Catherine Pass, mm -hmm. and that was the stop. They don't say anything about Fayette Pass because that's where all the losses were. Mm -hmm. Kasserine Pass has become very famous since the war for being this kind of very uh, strategically significant battle for the Americans when it was kind of the first big battle that we, we faced Germany in and realized there were a lot of things that they needed to change up yeah. strategically that in, in order to compete with the Germans, we needed to adapt as a military. So how did that impact you? Were you aware of some of those changes uh, that, that was going on and how things needed to change in order to better fight the Germans? Stay away from the mountains and the hills. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, 
We had a general that came and took over for us after they pulled Patton away. He was only there a month or so. Uh, took him back to England so he could screw up things there. Uh, I'm trying to think of it. He was not a West Pointer, but he was a college guy, and uh, he was good. He brought the tank commanders together, and he had a mound of dirt there, and he says, now this is the way it is, and this is where we want to go, and if we get through there, it will cut six weeks off from the program. And he was right, and we went through there like, and uh, clear up to the uh, ocean, and then we started getting prisoners. I could shake down a few of them, and uh, well, one time I shook him down, and somebody was, and the other Germans was slapping in the ear with crotch, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and finally I found out. He had a knife sewn in his crotch, and he was going to take somebody. Anyway, 20,000 prisoners went through, I would say, six or seven days past us, and we saw headlights for the first time. Lights were on. What was your... Go ahead. What was your interaction with the prisoners like? Did you talk to them very much? Or? Well, yeah, they, uh, a lot of them wanted to go to America, and uh, yeah, uh, there seemed to be one in every batch of maybe every 50 that could talk some English, and, and that's why. Oh, it, then they took me when they had taken them all there back. And they took me and some other guys to build a camp for them. So we had the barbed wire, we had the poles, we had the guns and everything. And so we got them to dig the holes and put the poles up and put the wire up and everything. And then we had to put the machine guns up there. And we taught them how to fix the machine guns because those are greasy stuff with cosmoline. And so... Uh, the officer come around and he said, you can't do that. And we said, oh, we won't do it anyway. And we didn't do it for a couple minutes and then we had to finish it up. Well, those towers there, we had to man them. And we didn't like that at all. So one guy says, I think I can cure this. And that night, something happened, a misfiring of his gun when he was cleaning it and it sheared down through the five tents and it wounded a few people. But you know, they sent us back to our own company. <laughs> and they, they was going to send us home, but uh, they sent ships with the MPs to take them back. I you see. Know. So my, my German prisoners were good in, uh, in north of uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, Port Sheridan, yeah. I had one kingpin that, that talked the language good and, and he got them to work and uh, tuning up the cars and so on, yeah. He did it. They did go on strike at one time just before Christmas. Uh, they wanted a certain kind of uh, hair lotion or something and they wouldn't work. And so come Christmas, and said, did you want Christmas dinner or not? They say, yeah, we'll go back to Christmas. <laughs> that was the end of the strike. <laughs> the first prisoners I captured, or they gave up to me, uh, I think it was three of them. And uh, I didn't know what to do with them. I said, go back that way. And they just stood around. And up comes the French Foreign Legion. And they said, we'll take them. And they took them back there. And I heard a half a dozen shots. And, and they come back to me and they said, Tedeschi, vamos. <laughs> I shot them right on the spot. Wow. 
didn't have any more trouble with them. Go ahead, since you brought up uh, Fort Sheridan. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where you ended your time in the military. Okay. Uh, the time at Fort Sheridan, uh, they had a lot of officers come in and get their orders and then go to the factories that are manufacturing world goods. And then we had farms up in northern part, and uh, we take the, them up to the farms to work and then bring them back and so on. And this one guy said, you know, you got 20 prisoners in here. He says, you're just one guy. I says, that makes it even. He turned around and never bothered me again. <laughs> but I did have trouble with one bunch. We went in to paint and clean the officers' quarters. And this guy strayed off and I was after him at the toilet all the time. So I refused him at dun dinner time when we went to dinner. I wouldn't take him. I said, he's, he's a troublemaker. And before I got off the truck, he had a fight going. So they had to settle the fight and take him off. The other guys, they were good. They were painting and they were happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. G going back to your time in North Africa and Italy, yeah. what was uh, what was hygiene like during the war for you, and, and how did that work in terms of um, uniforms and and that sort of thing? Old Patton wanted to send wolves over there. <laughs> yeah, we were in wolves all of North Africa. Wow. So when you decide to clean up, you didn't see any water, you got it. 100 octane gasoline, and dunked them in that, and it hung out to dry. And, well, before that, you cut the grease out of your collars and so on. Well, one time I did that, and they said, let's move out. We got a castle you should run into. That, that was in Italy. And so we wanted to capture them. And, my, my, put my clothes on, and a few miles down the road, I was getting warm, so I threw off my shirt and my undershirt, and then my pants, and I was bare naked the time we got to the castle. But, but I didn't get a bad burn, but he's gone, so uh, we didn't have to do anything. <laughs> but that was the worst. Oh, uh, no, they took me to the shower, on Anzio, and that was uh, the first shower we had. And they took us back to where there was a semi with six shower heads here, six shower heads there. And we stepped off the truck and they blew a whistle, take your clothes off. So we took our clothes off. Well, dirty clothes. So we went in and they blew the whistle and the water come on and then you could soap up and then let go off and you go out the other side. But you weren't sure of your own clothes being there. So you did with what you had. Sometimes you had too much and too tight. <laughs> Guess you didn't have much of a choice though. <laughs> that was the only shower I got on it. <laughs> no. When when you were in North Africa, were you fighting just the Germans, or were there other troops like like some of the the Vichy French troops that were there, or like uh, Italians, or was Vichy it? France was more around uh, Oran and so on, uh, and they were below us where the English had pushed them back. Yeah. Okay, so you mostly just encountered Germans during your mm -hmm. you just just Germans during your time then. Yeah, pretty okay. much so. How, how did fighting uh, the Germans in North Africa kind of differ from fighting in Italy? What, what were some of the big differences oh, yeah, there for you? Yeah. We, we differed. Uh, where they can set up and, and uh, uh, have a little battle month there. But in uh, the desert, you just didn't have a place to set up. Did you interact with uh, civilians very much in, in any time during your oh. service? Yeah, uh, we'd buy fruit and stuff from them, and uh, well, they camped around us a lot of times, and those camels make such a noise. Uh, at night, they're going, 
was uh, sleeping, we weren't. So we'd truck them back when we were going to have a little battle, and, and uh, the next morning they'd be right back before the battle started. Usually any fights we had in camp would probably be over booze or over food. Uh, the booze was, uh, uh, maintenance always had a still, so we had it fresh. I had one guy that was trying to get me to take some of that, and I wouldn't. He says, okay, uh, this one's got a bottle of water, this one's got the booze, so pick out which is which. And I hit the bottle of water every time, and he was mad as a... <laughs> so he come back and he said, well, I'll give you one more chance. Well, he had them both full of booze. So. He rigged the game that time. <laughs> oh! <laughs> he pushed your eyeballs out. <laughs> one, of my, one of my boys went back to... Uh, Kentucky, and he started up his deal, and they shot him right after he'd gone home. Yeah. Hmm. Revenueers. We had a lot of Kentucky boys. Indiana, and Michigan. Yeah. During your your time uh, with the the tanks, did you ever modify any any part of it to, to help adapt to kind of? battle conditions and once you once you would start facing the enemy did you realize there were things you could do to maybe help uh, better defend the tank or anything with uh, the ammunition or the, the the gun itself that you could improve they had a 50 caliber up on top for me to play with I'm too busy for that and so we wrapped it up and we put it down on the ground and uh, we got rid of that right away because we knew of, of two or three that had hit that and uh, give them bad wounds and so on. You know. So you just took the machine gun off the top of the tank? Yeah. yeah. Bury them. Yeah. How did you feel like your M4 tank compared to the, the German tanks that you came up against? How, oh, how, did, how did that compare? You see, the 88 was a high... A high powered job in long shell case, and we had just a 75. And most of them bounced off, would have scared the hell out of them, and so they gave up. <laughs> what what types of enemy tanks did you face? Do you remember the particular? Were there like Tiger tanks or what? Like various German well, tanks? M3s. I think the 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 Tiger was a four, if I remember right. And uh, they were hard to stop. The only thing to do was stop them in the tracks and, and then get out of their way. You know. mm -hmm. when, when a track broke on one of your tanks, were, what did it take to, to fix something like that? Were you able to do that in the midst of a battle or did you pretty oh, much... Well, um, yeah, you, you have to get it out of the battle because they, they have pins that they have to put in in blocks and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know something that's very important to you is your faith as, as a Christian. Uh, so talk about kind of your, uh, your experience with religion and your faith during the war, um, kind of at, at the beginning, how you went into the war, and then as the war progressed. Oh, okay. My father didn't want anything said about religion in our house, so I just hunted and fished and chased girls. And so when I got to the army, he said, what's your religion? I said, I don't have any. He said, you've got to have a religion. And he said, we've had a lot of Catholics. We've had some Jews. I'm going to put you down as a Protestant. <laughs> well, I was a Protestant, so I listened to this kid that was singing on Sunday mornings uh, coming back from church, and he says, boy, you better go with me because they feed you real meat. He says, they got those little stamps that gets real meat because we were just getting ground beef. And so I decided to become a Christian right then. And so I went with him for our six weeks there, well fed on Sunday. 
not so much for the rest of the days. And so when we got overseas, they had a chaplain that had a little organ, and he had an altar and the cross and uh, on the trailer, and he had a driver, and the driver would play the organ, and, and he would preach to us. And when we were shelled, he would say, hit the dead! And so we'd all go down. And we only had one guy wounded. He got hit in the leg. He didn't down quick enough. Mm -hmm. So it started as a very practical thing for you for going to church. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really have to tell us. <laughs> were, there, were there different services for the different denominations, like Catholic or like Jewish? And uh, No. Um, one day, on a, we were an outpost above beyond the infantry, and they sent a runner up and said, church service back. So my gunner and I went back, and uh, here was a Catholic priest standing there, and he says, is this all there is? And I said, don't know. So he found a little cave, and he went and uh, gave a Protestant service to us. And, and uh, you won't believe it, but the Holy Spirit was behind me in there. I knew it. I hate you will never experience until you die. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. So you uh, obviously to get to uh, to Europe, North Africa, and Italy, you had to spend a lot of time on. Uh, ships and being transported uh, on ships. Um, were, were you ever uh, directly attacked while you were, were sailing at all, or, or did you get just kind of like seasick, or what was that experience like? Um, we had one uh, scare going up to uh, Greenland and Iceland, and uh, the destroyer took care of that, and then we come down. Uh, let's see here. Um, Well, they didn't have enough uh, landing craft for us, so I missed the first one into Naples. And so when we got it, we went into Naples and we couldn't get up the mountain. And the, as fast as the engineers built the bridges, they would bomb them out. And even at four o'clock in the morning, they take care of it. Anyway, uh, bridges, bridges. We broke bridges in Louisiana, like going out of business. Uh, there's one other case I'm supposed to be telling you. Oh, can't do it, right? Can't do it right That's now. fine. The, br the bridges thing is an interesting thing, though. That's something that a lot of people don't think of, is that obviously you've got all of these tanks and large military vehicles yeah. that weighed a, weighed a lot. Yeah. Uh, and you had to make sure that the infrastructure was there in order to cross rivers and get through all of these obstacles. Yeah. So there was the whole engineering side to everything. Yeah, but sometimes they missed out, and we broke quite a few bridges. I was never, I was always at the edge to go to the bridge, so I didn't worry about it. The other tank went down. Hmm. Yeah, I I got some pictures of that in there, of broken tanks or. Broken bridges, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then at the when you left Italy to come back to the the yeah. U.S., how, how how did you get home? Oh, <clears throat> they had a ship for all of us guys, and they had a aircraft carrier over there, and we found out after we got underway that those aircraft were all tore up or something and they were tacking back the states so they just made a run straight across <laughs> great projection <laughs> going back to your time um training at it was fort knox right yeah 
what what were some of your your jobs there that you did while while you were at Fort Knox? Obviously, you you oh. had the tank, but oh yeah, uh, I learned that uh, KP is a good one to get on because you can be fed any time, and uh, the the other jobs of guarding empty tanks is not a thriller at all. And uh, let's see here, guard duty. Guard duty at the headquarters is it wears you out because they're coming and going all day. Yeah, I didn't like that at all. But I like garden tanks and, and garden prisoners and stuff, yeah. Mm hmm I think that's it, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so obviously you had a lot of experience in these different campaigns and battles. Mm -hmm. And si since, since the war ended, have you kind of read up uh, books that have been written about some of the battles and campaigns that you participated in? Have you kind of uh, read about other people's experience in, in those same battles or le kind of looked into that I, side of it more? I don't think so. Uh, they never covered us too much. Uh, we had reunions so we could swap stories and so on, but that is kind of petered out. And uh, so the last time I tried to get in touch with the first armored, they, they didn't answer, so that's the end of it. But I kept track of some of my men, and we would have many reunions and maybe travel somewhere. So, look at some sites and so on. And then I had two Iowa guys that I kept track until they died. And I still contact one of the wives about once a year. Yeah. You try and stay in touch with anyone that's still, still around? I don't think there's anybody left but me. Hmm. Yeah. Going going back to the uh, the Italy campaign, so yeah. you, you mentioned uh, the battle for Monte Cassino, and that that was kind of some of the the first uh, combat you participated in when you got to Italy. Um, so that that battle, you know, a, a lot has been written about that today in terms of the kind of historical significance of the monastery that was there at Monte Cassino yeah. and the the Allied decision to bomb that. So were you aware of... Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> you, was, uh, uh, you know, they bombed out the, the bridges, or the, the float bridges that they, the, the engineers made. And uh, we, we never even got to, onto the mountain to get to the monastery. And... Uh, that was all mule stuff. Oh, I know what I wanted to tell you. That the Japanese unit, now, the Japanese that were living in California were put in concentration camps, sort of recent locating. And this one guy, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This one battalion got up the mountain on the other edge and they wiped the guys out so that that mountain was clear again. That's why they sent us farther up in Italy they all, yeah. Really? And that was the Japanese, Japanese-American troops the Japanese fighting, American, fighting yeah. on the side of the U.S.? The young, young kids on the West Coast, yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, that was nice. And... Uh, I think the only nice thing I thought about Italy was that I didn't know anything about history, so they showed me all the old people and, and statues and all that. Didn't sink in. But uh, they had this Lake Brasciano just north of Rome. And it is beautiful sand, beautiful water. And we had a week there before we went the rest of the way. 
<laughs> no women, no. It's all men. <laughs> Not as fun. <laughs> well, I was told, you know, you can look, but don't touch. So remember that. <laughs> have Have you returned since the war ended to any of those areas that you served in, like Italy or anywhere in North Africa? No, no. I stay pretty well home, <laughs> USA. <laughs> So you, you talked uh, some about your your faith in kind of like going to church during during the war. Yeah. Um, uh, how did that impact you, um, like emotionally or spiritually, you know, your experiences in the war? See, I didn't know anything about church anyway, so I was learning from the bound up. And uh, when I come home, my first wife, Doris, and I moved to Grand Rapids and I worked there and we went to the church there and that's where it started. Then I had a chance to go down to Galene, which is down now near Niles, uh, to uh, a farm equipment dealer. And uh, so we went to a little German church there. And then when I married Bernil, Grace Bernil, uh, we always went to church everywhere. I always wore a necktie on Sunday. It was the only thing to do. And so I get mail, Bill with a necktie. <laughs> <laughs> That's how people know you. <laughs> oh, I'm a troublemaker here, I'll tell you. <laughs> you actually, uh, so speaking of your your first wife, you got married during the war, correct? Uh, he, he, no. Yeah, it was just, yeah. Uh, we had six weekends together before I was shipped overseas, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't, that means you had to drive from Louisville to Flint, Michigan and then you had a few hours and you said goodbye in the morning. I picked up three or four guys and took them back to the fort. And, uh, yeah. What, what was communication like with your wife then during, oh, throughout the war? Oh, that was really good. Yeah, every month you could figure out a letter coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, she wrote often, but it took 30 days to get to you, yeah. And the same way with cookies. Uh, I had got a lot of cookies in popcorn, and cakes in popcorn, because you see that made good packing, and I could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I had some ants that are crazy about me, and I don't know why yet, but uh, they sent cookies and, and cakes, and my wife sent some stuff, but Oh, I tell you. Butler's got a package again, and they all rush over. <laughs> you were a popular guy. <laughs> I was. Well, you see, when I went in the Army, I didn't smoke or anything, and uh, so I sold my cigarettes, and I had my suit at the home on there, and I rented it out for the weekend, five bucks for every weekend. <laughs> And so they called me Little Jew. Well, I was Little Jew before that because my friend and I picked up stuff from the alleys and to, uh, a cart and we kept it in it. And then we got a Model T Ford and put it together and, and we picked up more stuff. And then finally one of the guys says, are you one of us? And I said, oh yeah, right on. I didn't know what he meant. So from then on, I got gefilte fish, crackers, <laughs> and better prices for batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Not 50 cents anymore, 75. <laughs> so I loaned money in the army, and when they come out of the payroll, you want to be there or they're gone into the town again. And uh, so I loaned money and got money and uh, it worked out good. Yeah. But 
five bucks for my suit on the weekend. You know, that's yeah, that's good. I was only making thirty one. Right, <laughs> that's a lot of money back then. <laughs> it was, and the one kid that used it a lot, I took it with me. No, I didn't. I sold it to him, and he put it in his barracks bags. And when they called, Wolf, Wolf, he didn't answer. There it was his bags, but my suit was gone. He left the ship in New York. Wow. Never got on. Go going back to uh, North Africa, so wow. I know you, you passed through uh, Morocco a couple of different times throughout your, your time yeah. coming and going from there. <coughs> what, was, uh, what was your experience <coughs> in uh, Morocco like? You see, the ones that went in there, uh, just outside of old Gibraltar, they got just raked over the cold. Terrible, terrible. And we went into this other one as a milk wall. And then things settled down, and we uh, went on to uh, uh, back to Iran and uh, could go in town and so on. But we usually got our, our uh, fruit and so on from the natives, and, and uh, there was no entertainment. Or once in a while, uh, they would have a, a celebrity from California put on a show on the back of a truck, and, but not too many of them, not too many. Well, it was too dangerous for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've uh, you've mentioned a few times about your experience at Anzio and like the the Anzio beachhead in Italy. Yeah. Uh, so talk a, talk a little bit more about kind of why was that important strategically? <clears throat> well, why 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 did the Allies want to land there? What was their goal? Well, we couldn't get past the mountain, so they thought they'd go into Anzio, and we'd be well below Rome yet, and uh, so that was a fairly good landing, and, uh, but we had to dig a ditch for a tank, and I never did that before. What? And so, uh, so in the bombing, it wouldn't bother in any tanks, and uh, we could go out and do whatever they needed done. And then we had our own slit trenches, or two of you can uh, go together and make it a little hot there, and uh, we'd use the lights from the tank, run lights so we could read at night. Mm -hmm. When you when you say you dug a trench for a tank, uh, what what exactly? Hmm? How how did that work? When you say you dug oh, a trench for a uh, tank, enough so that it covers. Uh, it would be a, the treads would be uh, even with the ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how, how long were you dug in there at Anzio before the, before the Allies started to try to break out towards Rome? Oh, five months. Really? And that was all just in the, the same spot oh, there? They just sent us out and sashay in. There was a factory there uh, out the Germans used as a, a buttress or a fortress, and they'd work out of that, so they bombed them an awful lot. And uh, we just, well, you see that's all farmland there, flat land, muck. So I had to stay on three roads, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were limited, limited areas you could move in. Yeah, it was difficult. Yeah, yeah. How when when you were when you were in a tank? How how did the terrain affect you in terms of moving up hills or mountains or the sand in the desert? What what? How did the tank handle those different types of conditions? Oh, the little little M twos, I think they were uh, that we started with. Uh, they never went in deep water or anything. Just in the, in the river by uh, Fort. Well, there it lost it. Anyway, in the river close by, and uh, so they tried to put pontoons out for us to try 
and, and get on those and, and drive across. I know one time, the first time I ever drove down into the river, the guys were standing on the pontoon waving me down, so I thought high gear wouldn't be too bad, and boy, you ought to see those guys jump off. <laughs> I learned you don't go down fast. <laughs> was was there a a steep learning curve to uh, operating a tank and the different positions within a tank? Was it difficult for guys to? Yes, there were. Yeah, um, you went through each one, and I don't know how they pick you up, but uh, I was a driver for a long time, and. Uh, then I was put in command. And then, then uh, my uh, platoon leader got wounded. He messed up his hands, and so I had the platoon from then on. But I never got the rating because he was uh, turned to duty with just one arm, and so. I don't know what else to tell you other than I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> Home alive in 45. <laughs> Was that your motto back then? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a good way to bring up kind of the end of the war then. So you were, you were still active at the base in Illinois, right? When the fort in Illinois, when the war ended? Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. They were getting ready to get rid of me. They they wanted to have me ready to go to the islands. But when the islands changed, uh, this President Truman mm -hmm. dropped that bomb. That changed the whole thing. And we're looking for the same thing from Russia now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We better be ready. So did you, was that the end of your uh, service in the Army then, once the war ended? That's what did it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was the transition back to civilian life for you, like, after that? <clears throat> well, let's see. I went back to my old job of uh, being a packing uh, boy and an auto supply. And, and selling on the counter, and I stayed with that for a while, and then they put me in charge of uh, rebuilding engines. I had good mechanics and good guys there, and uh, but I wanted to do something else. And I tried auto racing, and that broke me, so I finally went back to automotive, and then I had an opportunity to get a job way down in Colleen, Michigan. Never heard of it before. And my wife says, if you want to try it, try it. So I did. And so uh, a year with him, and uh, I found out the reason he hired me is he had a guy that was jacking him up in his parts department. He was going to another dealer and then having a ace on the hole, that was it. But he and I went into business with his brother-in-law for about a year or so, and uh, the brother-in-law didn't like it at all, so we liquidated it, and in about two or three years, my salesman and I worked with, uh, we went together for 37 years, and he got sick and we sold off. Made more money off of buildings and land than we ever did <laughs> in the business. <laughs> no, I don't think so quite, but it seemed that way. Is there, is there anything that you uh, feel like people misunderstand about World War II veterans or you know people who served in the war? Any anything that? It's like a misconception that you you try to correct in the, the public perception of the war in general or, or your service during the war? Well, I would say hit them as heavy as you can. 
because you, if you can uh, shake the, the civilians up, you got a chance. But you got to have high power stuff to do things like that. Uh, I would say that the uh, um, the federal hospitals probably need a little checking into. Yeah. Yeah. Improving some of those like care facilities for yeah. No, I've got a picture here I would like to have you mm -hmm. pick up and look at it. Yeah. That's a check from the government for one cent. Wow. Why why one cent? I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't spend it, I know that. <laughs> so what uh what year is this from? I, is this a few I don't know. Let's see. You'd have to see the date on the check. Yeah. <laughs> but this just arrived for one one penny to you at some point? I think it's from twenty seventeen. It says. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you feel like that's uh, you're even now with the government, that check kind of has <laughs> paid off all the... <laughs> yeah, I don't want to... Well, they, they give me hearing aids and so on and so on. I can't complain. No. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I think that's all I had for you. Was there anything, any other stories or anything else you wanted to, to share that uh, memories from, from your experience during the war? I don't think so. But you're away from your women a long time, and uh, it's hard. And there's always a camp somewhere where there's women, and, and you have to stay away. You know? You can look, but you can't touch. I lived by it. My father was a little tipsy on women, so I knew what I was doing to my mother. 